Good morning. Froh wieder in Berlin zu sein. Um, I switched to English. It's much easier for me. Uh, let's talk hamburgers. Different subject than the previous one. Feeding the world is a very complex problem. Not only because we are going to 10 billion people, but also because those 10 billion have increasing appetites for high-quality proteins. And high-quality proteins, such as meat, I love meat, and I suspect some of you do too, um, some of those high-quality proteins are extremely resource-intense, right? So resource-intense that in the coming 35 years, this is not going to be a sustainable proposition. So we have to do something about that. To give you an example, for a quarter pound of hamburger, uh, you require about eight pounds of proteins, wheat, grass, soy, whatever uh, cows eat, uh, about 200 liters of fresh water, um, 800 square meters of land, and enough energy to power your microwave for 10 minutes. That's just one hamburger. That resource intensity translates into that we're currently using 70% of all our arable land for livestock agriculture, 70%. And according to the FAO, this is a report, by the way, from 2008, in uh, 2050, meat consumption will be 70% higher. And you can easily do that math. There's not going to be enough planet to sustain that. In addition to that, and I suspect that in Germany that has been very well publicized by now, uh, we know that livestock contributes about 15 to 20 percent to all greenhouse gas emission. And I particularly like this image because you will never forget it after this, right? <laughs> by the way, it's, a, it's technically a wrong image because they don't fart methane, they actually belch methane, but there is no fire spitting cow on the internet. <laughs> So let me, let me ask you a question. Who of you was already aware of these issues? Wow, <laughs> that's quite a bit. Okay, so now, now comes the awkward question. <laughs> Who of you is vegetarian? I'm in Berlin, of course, I could have expected this. Like about, but it's still, you know, it's still less than 10%. So apparently for the other 90%, including myself, it's very difficult to translate that knowledge into behavior, right? We can all become vegetarians. The first wall I want to break down is breaking down the myth that you and I need animal proteins. We don't, right? We grew up with that, but it's really fake news. There are two billion vegetarians on this planet, two billion. Most of them are involuntarily vegetarian because they cannot afford to eat meat. But they live, and they procreate, and they're happy, and they have a decent life expectancy. So, and there are quite a few vegetarians in this room who kind of look healthy, I suspect. <laughs> so, what else can we do? Um, so this is a muscle cell. You might remember this from high school biology. It's a, it's a large cell. It's a merger between a number of cells, hence the uh, green dots. Those are the nuclei of those original cells that made up this muscle fiber. Um, and you also see a couple of guys that are white. And these were, about 18 years ago, the, uh, designated to be the stem cells of our muscle. Right? They're sitting there doing nothing waiting to repair that tissue when it's injured. So if you tear your muscle, they come in, they start to divide, and they start to form muscle tissue. They repair that muscle fiber, a wonderful regenerative system. Now, they do that inside of the body, but they can also do that outside of the body. And that's exactly what we're doing. So we poke a cow in the butt, get a small sliver of muscle out of it, one centimeter long, one millimeter in diameter, this already has a couple of hundred of these stem cells. And we let them do what they do very well, proliferate. Right? So that from a very small sample, you can grow a large amount of beef, then reducing the number of cows, and you're reducing the methane, for instance. Then you have just cells. Cells are not really protein-rich. Um, they don't taste very well. Uh, they don't have that wonderful bite. You, can, you cannot throw them on the barbecue. Um, so we have to do something about it. We have to let them make meat. And since these are designated 
muscle stem cells, they kind of do that by themselves. So the first trigger is we starve them and then they start to merge into a primitive uh, muscle fiber. And then, of course, as you all know, they have to perform labor. And so there we have to pull a couple of tricks. We have to put them in a ring structure um, and we put them in a gel that allows them to find each other and to attach to each other and form a tissue. And then, magically, they start to contract. Ladies and gentlemen, our muscle cells are exercise junkies. <laughs> our brains are not, but these are not connected to our brain, so that's why they, uh, it doesn't bother them. So they start, to, uh, they start to contract, and since they are in this ring structure, that develops tension. And as everybody who goes to the gym knows, that tension is actually the biggest trigger for protein synthesis, right? So we let them do that for three weeks, and then you have a muscle fiber and uh, what we did, we made 10,000 of those muscle fibers and made a hamburger out of it. Who of you would like to eat lab-grown hamburgers? Ha! Huh, not too many. I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, missionary work to do, I guess. <laughs> so we presented this in London in a uh, hybrid between a cooking show and a press conference. Um, and it was uh, cooked and eaten. Uh, that hamburger cost us about a quarter million euro to make. And it was... <laughs> gobbled up in five minutes by two food critics, uh, Hani Rutzler from Austria and Josh Schoenwald from Chicago. And they said, oh yeah, this is a hamburger. Um, it's a little bit dry, there was no fat tissue in it, and um, so it had, we needed some work to do. Um, and, um, but yeah, it was there. Basically, we showed that you can do this, and we also took the opportunity to tell everybody, wait a minute, we have to think about how we're going to produce meat in the future. So after having seen this, you have to see this wonderful hamburger, you have two people who have eaten it, I can tell you they're both still alive. Um, so who of you has changed their mind from no to, well, maybe? Well, a few. So I've, I've, yeah, I've done some of my work at least. Okay. Now that's interesting. You have kind of what we call a proof of concept. How do you make a product out of it? Because obviously a quarter million euro hamburger is not going to change the world. Um, and this is a cell culture. We have all those conditions under control. Uh, we can do cell selection. We can pick the cells that are much better at it than others. Uh, and of course, we have to scale up production to make it more kind of efficient. Um, the cow is really very inefficient, hence why we need them feed, to feed them eight times more than we get out of it. Um, those cells we have to make uh, more efficient. That's the, that's the final goal. Now, one of the things with stem cells is they are quite peculiar. They, they have sort of a renewal cycle to give new stem cells so that they can go on forever. And then they give off daughter cells that actually make the tissue. And so one of our tricks is to select those stem cells and keep them going as stem cells um, and get the most out of that biopsy that we can. Currently, uh, you translate that in kind of how many cells can you get out of one cell? And so how many times can it double? So here on the x-axis, there is the amount of doublings, which currently is about 32, 35. And on the y-axis, this is an exponential axis, you see how much meat we can get out of one sample. So that would translate into going from one and a half billion cows on this planet to maybe 30, 40,000. Now it also has to be sustainable, meaning that every component in there is of unlimited supply or seemingly unlimited because you can recycle it. And one of the issues with cell culture is that we use blood to culture the cells, at least a, a portion of it. And to get those cells in that ring structure, we need a gel, and that's also animal-derived, or at least that was animal-derived in 2013. So currently, we are growing these cells in the absence of serum. There are all sorts of replacers for that, um, and so we have kind of cracked that problem, and also the gel um, is now replaced by a gel coming from algae. We have algae enough, it's very cheap, and it's food compatible. So would this actually mean something? Would this reduce land and water and energy. And for that, you do a life cycle analysis, which is a little bit difficult because there's no 
process yet and no product that is completely described. So it's called an anticipatory life cycle um, analysis. But some of those show that 90% land would be saved, 90% water, and about 60% of energy. That would be a big deal if we reach that, right? So, of course, we also need to make it really meat, like color and texture and taste. Because we have meat substitutes galore, uh, but we, you and I, really want to have real meat, right? And of course, that product in 2013 didn't have any fat tissue, so now we're currently making fat tissue. It's kind of an odd thing to do. Uh, this is all medical technology, and in the medical field, there was not a lot of incentive to make fat tissue, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, we are basically using natural fatty acids to generate that fat tissue. So the next version will have the muscle and the fat, and will hopefully not be as dry as the first one. <laughs> and then something interesting happened in 2013. The popular press said, yuck. And I was extremely frustrated by that. Not because there was kind of sort of a reservation against it. I kind of expected that but because I didn't really understand what was behind that reservation. I mean, you guys eat um, hot dogs and Weisswurst and all those things that nobody knows what's in it, <laughs> right? Or how it's being made. And you kind of eat it. So why not just eat a hamburger that's made by me? <laughs> right? So that was the, <coughs> that was the, um, the dilemma. And I realize it's actually very, very simple. Was der Bauer nicht kennt, das frisst er nicht. <laughs> right? And it has to do with safety. So we need early adopters. We have those plenty. I suspect there would be a couple in the audience. Um, and then you just need time. So that will happen. There are a couple of surveys um, that have been done over the course of the last six, seven years in different areas, US, UK, India, China. Um, and you see the blue bars here say, well, yes, I would eat it. So they gradually kind of increase over time. Um, and you see that there's not a lot of issues with specific geography. So I'm pretty hopeful that the acceptance will eventually come. Of course, we made that hamburger for a quarter million euro. Um, but by scaling up and by improving the processes, you can actually reduce that price. So we're currently thinking about about 140 euro per kilo, which is still a lot, which is way too much for, let's say, the supermarket. Um, but that's already kind of within a marketable price, I guess. To get that price even further down, and we think it can be the same as meat or even cheaper than regular meat because of that efficiency, um, we have to actually look at Sources, sources for the feed of these cells. Um, and we're looking at the feed industry, the, the animal feed industry, because they have all the sources, the sugar beets, the fodder beets, the, the, the grass, the wheat, all those things. Um, they're not immediately palatable to our cells, of course, but you can make them palatable to the cells. So we're looking at that uh, currently to source those really cheap the, and really at scale, right? Because you will require a tremendous scale to make this happen. Up to um, 2013, actually up to three years ago, we were the only ones in the world doing this. And that feels kind of lonely, I can tell you. Um, fortunately, and I'm, I'm very happy about this, and there was something said about competition earlier. Uh, right now, there are 40 to 50 startups in the entire world doing this. They're either working on beef, pork, chicken, fish, um, or any other. Uh, type of animal product. They are funded by large meat industries, by venture capital, by governments, um, and so forth. So this is still relatively small, but it's getting there. And I'm really hopeful that that will, um, will happen. Uh, of course, this is a novel food, so it has to be uh, approved by EFSA. Uh, this is non-GMO, uh, which makes it a little bit easier, but still is a <coughs> uh, something. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> the, so this is my vision for the future. Very simple one, very romantic one. We can keep on barbecuing. I, I know you love barbecuing in this country. Um, we can keep on barbecuing, eating the things that we love to eat without the negative externalities of um, industrial meat production. So 
the two walls that I want to break is one, I hope I've broken that for you at least. Um, ah, there's the other guy. Um, <laughs> one is... <laughs> just don't focus on him, focus on me, because these are really... <laughs> um, one is um, to break down the myth that we need animal proteins. And the second is large industrial livestock farming. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.